Hey guys, welcome to a special discussion video about how we rate and score video games. As many of you know, I work as a full-time teacher and deal with grading and rating almost every day. I'm going to try use my experience and understanding in the academic field to explore how we rate video games. Though honestly, my opinions here could apply to how we rate almost anything from food to movies. Now, as a side note, I've created another video where I attempt another method of rating and scoring video games, which you could try out, though I do recommend watching both this video video and that one before joining the discussion. So onto the topic. Video game ratings have always been a murky area and there really isn't a fixed way of doing things. The way we tend to rate quality in almost anything tends to be numerical, whether it's hotel stars or the percentage on your English paper in school. Though sometimes these numbers seem to be arbitrary or influenced based on personal experience. I mean, what's the real difference between a student who scores 65% on their math paper compared to the one who scored 75%? Is it any real indication of their proficiency? This is a problem in education as well as in video game scoring, currently perpetuated by sites such as Metacritic and others, where they take a whole bunch of different rating systems and convert it to a flat and I might say meaningless percentage. This debate has been going on for decades and it has caused a lot of anger and frustration, but that's because rating systems are really trying to simplify and communicate what is and isn't valuable. So in video games, if something you value gets a low score, it's very difficult not to take it personally because it's basically someone else telling you that what you value isn't valuable at all. This shouldn't be an issue because in reality, everyone has different preferences and opinions and you're never going to get everyone in the world to agree with you. If you have problems accepting that, then you're going to face quite a bit of difficulty in life. But this can be an issue when someone is put in a position of power and influence, such as a critic or reviewer, and everyone is basically told that this person puts in a lot more effort and research, thus portraying the fact that they are experts and generally knows a lot more about video games than you do, and you should follow their opinion. This perspective isn't that useful or true, but it is common. This gets even worse when people get offended and defensive or worse of all succumb to confirmation bias, looking up only the reviews that match their opinion, basically creating the illusion that they are right and everyone who disagrees is wrong, citing all the reviews they agree with or sinking to the lowest possible position of making up facts to support a non-existent argument. It's no wonder why Total Biscuit refuses to give review scores of any kind. Now, there's a few issues that we're dealing with here. First, what aspects of a video game people value differs from person to person. Some of you might really value the visual aesthetics and graphics of a game, while others couldn't care less about how it looks and only values gameplay. Some would value both. This is true of people who review video games too, and their reviews would likely be influenced by what they personally value in games, and their personal experiences in previous games. Second, just because something is good doesn't mean that we'll want to experience it more. Sometimes we just want a relaxing, casual experience. Sure, if someone were to ask you which is more valuable, chess or Farmville, I'm certain most people would say chess. However, chess can be a very heavy experience and sometimes we just need to unwind and do something less taxing, like play Farmville. This could lead you to end up playing Farmville a lot more than you do chess or even enjoying Farmville more than you do chess, even if you still value chess a lot more and recognize that it is a more valuable experience. Third, converting an experience into a numerical score is practically impossible. The simpler you make the scoring system, the more general and unspecific its meaning. However, the more complex you make it, the harder it is for people who need your review to consume and understand it. The simplest you can go is a good or bad rating with a thumbs up or thumbs down. A step up could be gold, silver and bronze. Then there's the five stars, then out of 10, then a percentage rating along with many others. I first noticed this issue way back in X-Play days when Adam Sessler had to explain what a 5 out of 5 meant as people were sending in hate mail. X-Play itself went through four different rating primers which tried to give a description explaining what their scores meant. In 2007, Adam and Morgan stated that the 5 point system was better than a 10 point system, pointing out that it reflected the perspective that video game ratings were broad generalizations and not absolute specifics, and that a 10 point system implied there was some kind of accuracy to the scoring. But in reality, anything below a 5 basically meant it was crazy. Crap. Despite that, in 2012, X-Play introduced the half star due to the 5 point rating system being too easy or too general, stating that you should really read the full review before screaming at the screen anyway. 
Adam even brought this debate over to his next job at Rev3 Games, where they initially tried to avoid a numerical rating system, but found that it was too messy and difficult to communicate to audiences. So why do we need reviews at all? Well, we need a way to communicate the quality of something when someone is going to invest time or money into it. A university needs to know if a student is worth taking on. Newlyweds need to know if a particular hotel is worth spending their honeymoon in. Much like a consumer needs to know if they should spend time and money on a video game. Most people don't do their own research about video games and rightfully so. People tend to either be too busy, lazy, or have financial constraints to do their own in-depth analysis. So they turn to others to provide a kind of buyer's guide. Also, if everyone did their own research, video game critics wouldn't be needed at all, but we still need reviewers of some kind because the point of a review is to indicate whether a game is worth spending time and money on, and to review it yourself, you're going to have to buy and play it yourself, defeating the purpose. So how could we make this whole situation better? Well first, we can start by understanding the difference between subjectivity and objectivity. A review of anything is going to be subjective in some way or form, along with any top 10 or top 100 lists out there. The preferences of the reviewer will influence their decisions and cause them to focus on things that you may not focus on. There are objective points, of course, if a game is buggy, unfinished or straight up broken, then it is objectively bad and not fit for purpose. However, if you're trying to rate the style, comparing realistic to cartoony, then that is going to be a subjective preference. The important thing is to not put subjectivity under the guise of objectivity, which is all too easy to do, and something we all need to work on. Saying that you hate 2D games is perfectly fine, but saying that 2D games are straight up bad is trying to put your subjective opinion as an objective fact, and it doesn't work. Second, we can all try to figure out what we subjectively value in games. If you can reflect on your own experiences and really do some self-analysis, you could make it easier on yourself in terms of knowing what you're looking for, while understanding that others are looking for something else. Now, I'm not saying that you should make an absolute list and stick to it. Your preferences can and most likely will change over time, but knowing what you value most can help you make your own judgement on video games. For a broad example, I know I love games with moral ambiguity and a sense of consequence, and this helps me look for new games that would personally give me a more fulfilling experience. And third, we can move towards personality-based reviews. What I mean by this is, much like how Adam Sessler explained on his episode of Sessler's Something titled How to Score, he pointed out it would be more effective if people found reviewers that match their personal aesthetic. So we wouldn't have an IGN review or a Rev3 Games review, but instead an Adam Sessler review or a Total Biscuit review. Total Biscuit himself mentioned this exact point in his video titled Stop Liking Things I Don't Like, Relativism in Games Critique, explaining how it's not about taking a person's opinion at face value, it's about understanding your own perspective and using the opinions around you to come to a consensus. In the end, you need to figure out your own and others' preferences, along with realizing and understanding the differences between what you value and what others value. Once we all get used to this practice, then we might have a much easier time with video game reviews and rating systems. Unfortunately, it's going to take a little bit of effort on everyone's part. Alright, so those are my opinions on the issue right now. If you'd like to see my attempt at creating my own personal rating system for video games, click the annotation or link in the description. Maybe you could get some ideas and let me know what you think. Anyway, that's all for now. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.